it's great to be here and to see a lot of uh, friendly, familiar faces. Um, you'll see if you look at the title of this talk, it's slightly different than on the program. Uh, we thought of broadening it quite a bit and not just focus on the work that we've done at, uh, at St. Lucia. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kick off very briefly, give you a little bit of background in terms of lead toxicity and wildlife in general. We'll look at the first recorded case um, of lead accumulation in, in captive alligators. Uh, then we'll move over to the first study in terms of wild uh, crocodiles, um, which led to this first experimental study that was done in Australia on the same species. And uh, then we'll focus a bit and I'll tell you some of the results of our work at Lake St. Lucia. And then finally, we'll just make a few comments in terms of the way forward. So in terms of background, lead is everywhere in the environment. Um, and it's got no known sort of physiological or metabolic benefit to animals. It's acute. It can be acute. It can be chronic. And it often is fatal. It's a, it's a disorder that can attack a whole lot of different systems in the body at the same time, like the nervous system, the hematological system, neuromuscular, and it apparently is a very complex disease to, to solve. Lead toxication in wildlife uh, happens mostly, or should I say almost primarily through um, oral ingestion, not really through the skin or inhalation. And in humans, lead toxicity is really well studied. Um, and there's a whole body of information in terms of birds, but really in terms of crocodilians, there's very little known in terms of uh, the keto, uh, um, the toxiokinetics of lead, the way that it moves through the body, uh, and also the effect of lead um, on, on animals in, in polluted environments. Um, not only crocodilians, but other representative of, uh, of ectotherms also generally have received really very little uh, studies and research in terms of lead. Now, crocodilians are a really great animal to study because they can grow to, to become almost in century. They are apex predators. They feed both on the terrestrial as well as the aquatic uh, uh, food web. Um, they can occupy multiple positions within a particular trophic system based on size. And all these things just make them a really good animal to study uh, in terms of uh, environmental health. Now, this first reported study in terms of lead poisoning um, happened just a bit more than 20 years ago. Um, and a number of mortalities were reported at a particular alligator farm in Louisiana. They were all very small individuals, just less than a meter in size. Clinical signs included wasting of the tail muscle, poor growth, there were obvious mortalities as well, as well as weight loss and anorexia and general lethargy. During the post-mortems, the vets found entire lead bullets and bullet fragments within the stomach of these uh, alligators. And the, the question kind of was why, you know, where was this coming from? So that was um, when they looked at the food that the alligators got, it was all nutria, which is a large South American rodent. It was released in Louisiana in the early 1930s, and it subsequently became an invasive rodent, and it's cold. So that's where the food uh, came from. Now, alligators, uh, these gators had uh, blood lead levels of very little, three up to 280 micrograms per deciliter. That's the, the unit that I will um, use throughout. Just to put this into clinical perspective, uh, falcons and waterfowl, blood lead levels are considered, if it's more than 100 micrograms, it's, it's toxic. Mammals, uh, sort of from 60 to 80 milligrams per deciliter. And then humans, there's really no safe level in humans, but um, the World Health Organization um, have stated that threshold of concern is if children specifically have levels of uh, of about five micrograms per deciliter. All right, back to the, the alligators. They were elevated um, lead in the kidney as well as in the liver and, and, and in the tissue. So the perplexing thing was despite some of these gators that died and some of them that had really high uh, blood level burdens, there were very little sign of some of them that had really high levels of, um, of lead in terms of any sort of clinical symptoms. Why only young, young, one-year-old mortalities? The sort of the hypothesis is that the, the large alligators that were also fed nutria um, have a much greater sort of body ratio and blood volume 
to the ingested lead. So they seemingly can cope better with it. A lot of the lead at the end of the day is also sequestered into the bone matrix. Moving to the first case in, in wild crocodiles, this is a, a national park in Australia in the Northern Territories, Kakadu National Park. So what happened there in 1999, there were a couple of reports of mortalities, saltwater crocodiles and the rangers investigated these mortalities. During the post-mortems, they found a lot of um, bullets. They also found shotgun pellets as well as fishing sinkers within their stomachs. Now, all the mortalities came from a particular zone within Kakadu where the Aboriginal people are still allowed to hunt. In fact, they've been doing this for, for, for hundreds of years. So they can hunt and fish within these zones. And, and there are other zones within Kakadu where there's no hunting and fishing whatsoever. So historically, they used to use spears, um, but since the 1950s, they are allowed to also use rifles, shotguns, and they, they can fish. Right, so they tend to uh, kill mac by geese, feral pigs, flying foxes, which is like a, a big um, fruit-eating bat. So the researchers sampled 40 crocodiles in total, um, 20 from the hunting and 20 from the low hunting zones. And they looked at um, lead levels in osteoderm. So that's the bony plate on the back of crocodiles. They surgically remove uh, an osteoderm and they also took some tissue samples from the tail. Results in the non-hunting zone, so the, the area where the Aboriginals were not allowed to hunt, the lead levels were quite low, sort of 1.2 to, to almost 10, um, and which can sort of be considered as background noise. The osteoderms within the intensive hunting area had much, much higher um, lead levels, not blood lead, this is in the bone itself, so microgram per gram, and there was also lead found in tissue, not a lot, but still about five times more than the previous alligator case study. Now, the possible sort of, or the plausible exposure pathway in these, uh, in these hunting areas would be then from the anthropogenic lead bullets to crocodiles via uh, crocs that would either kill or wound, uh, kill the wounded prey. And by doing that, they, they ingest the lead. Also, lead bullets from healthy crocodiles that are killing magpie geese, and the magpie geese forage, and through their foraging activities, they, they end up getting some of these um, shotgun pellets in the, in, the, in the mud. And then finally, sinkers um, end up in the crocodile's stomach via normal gastrolith or stomach stones acquisition. Um, what was interesting is that the, the lead carbon ratios in the uh, in the, um, the bony osteoderms were, um, had led throughout the osteoderm. So these laminations or layers every year it gets laid down. So from the, from the core of the osteoderm all the way to the outer layers had, had, had lead levels, which kind of just, um, you know, uh, showed that the exposure had been really long term. And again, interesting, no clinical symptoms uh, for these crocodiles. Because it was the first study that looked at um, lead exposure or accumulation in bone, the authors uh, could not really make any sort of statements in terms of the biological significance of this. Um, then this moved on to an experimental study. So as the lead poisoning from the bullets and the sinkers was the most possible cause for, for in Kakadu, um, the researchers felt it, it deemed worth having an experimental study to try and figure out one or two things. Firstly, to demonstrate that the digestive system can both retain as well as dissolve the ingested bullets or the sinkers. And then secondly, to look if this dissolved iconic, um, ionic lead was then absorbed into the blood and accumulated in the, in the bloodstream. So there were six study animals, um, 21.7 and 2 meters, all saltwater crocodiles, uh, and there was four in the treatment group and two in the control group that was fed pebbles, small little stones. The um, five pre-weighted shotgun bullets, so really, really sort of small pellets, um, um, were given to the saltwater crocodiles. They were packed in karoo meat, kangaroo meat, and then given to the three individuals, while the fourth individual got double the dose. So he got 10, 10 bullets. Blood samples was taken throughout the 20-week study period. 
Um, and a stomach lavage was performed at the end of the 20 weeks, as well as a radiograph, just to check that no, that they got all the lead, that all the lead is accounted for. In terms of the results, the blood level of the control animals remained low, which is interesting, still up to uh, 14, uh, um, 30 uh, grams per deciliter, but it remained constant uh, throughout the study period. The, croc the crocodiles that got the five bullets, the three of them uh, initially had a huge spike, 10 to 20 fold increase, um, and then that sort of leveled out after a week um, and at, at an equilibrium of about 321 mean um, blood level burden. And then finally, the one crocodile that was fed the 10, uh, 10 shot dose um, had sort of a slower uptake of the lead. It leveled out um, and then later on it increased again up until a very high level of, of over 500 microgram. And it stayed like that for the remainder of the study. So the crocodiles remained in good physical condition. There was no clinical symptoms in terms of, of lead poisoning. Um, most of the, uh, the bullets were removed at the end of the study period. One or two got uh, this uh, sort of I couldn't find. Um, of course, to do the lavage is quite difficult uh, to get these small little pellets out. In terms of the actual erosion of the lead, uh, the mean erosion rate, uh, erosion percentage was 20, uh, 26%. And they've estimated at this erosion rate, complete dissolution would occur uh, in about between 18 months and three years, so quite a long time. So these observations suggest that these high blood level can be sustained for several months um, and that the crocs seemingly have resistance um, for any clinical um, effects. Then in St. Lucia in 2010, we collected blood samples from uh, 34 crocs in three different study areas in Dumu, Cozy Bay and the Lake St. Lucia is trying system. In terms of the results in Cozy Bay, the mean blood level was 6.4, relatively low. For Dumut was 17.2, quite similar, and the variation was also very constant. But in St. Lucia, there was a lot, lot higher blood levels, um, which, which was mainly driven, the variation, by this one particular individual that had um, a, a lead um, value of 960. Um, and also from almost non-detectable, so from three to 960 extreme variation within a single system. So 53% of the samples had all elevated blood, more than 10. Um, the St. Lucia male that I've just showed you is, as far as we know, the highest um, a blood level for any free-range invertebrate species. We did test for lead because the obvious question, where was this lead coming from? With a handheld um, uh, X-ray, uh, fluorescent handheld device. But the, the sediment lead levels were below detection. The geology consists of dunes. Uh, although there's a lot of heavy metals, there's not really any lead ore. Coal mines do contaminate soil with lead, but again, the levels was really low, or generally the levels are, are very low. We haven't actually tested that, and that's something that one can do. So we attributed the, the lead levels based on many, many decades of fishing at St. Lucia using fishing sinkers and more recently drop shots um, throughout well, from 2009 to 2014, uh, we recorded eight crocs that died for various reasons. Um, and in all of these uh, uh, stomachs, we did find lead. So that photograph just shows you the gastroliths or the stomach stone, 63 of them. And then we recorded a mammalian hair, and then there are some drop shots as well as lead. This is another crocodile stomach uh, where you can see um, small uh, fragments of lead as well as some glass and a spark plug. So crocodiles, they swallow these sinkers, um, you know, because of the normal stomach stones acquisition that they all do, as well as drop shots. Occasionally, they also steal uh, bait from fishermen. Um, the gastroliths are used to mechanically break down the foods in a very acidic um, environment, environment of the stomach. Then the, the the lead are, are retained in the stomach because of this um, pylorus valve. So it prevents 
any objects from passing out into the duodenum and being excreted as waste. Um, so then lead uh, bullets that get retained in the stomach over many months, it could even be years, eventually getting sequestrated from the blood into soft tissues and organs and finally into bone. And the bone often carries um, the, the largest portion of the, of the burden. Um, again, you know, it seems like these crocodiles are, are living seemingly um, without any clinical uh, symptoms. None of these crocs showed any uh, form of disease or lethargy or deformation, attrition. This is just to give an idea that particular individual that had the high blood level values, um, this is a, a transmit we had on this individual for more than a thousand days and it moved uh, on average 1.2 kilometers a day in total more than 1,200 kilometers throughout the whole lake system. So clearly this animal was, was, was moving. Um, Although adults can tolerate uh, heavy body burdens, it seems like some of the females can shunt lead into embryos. That has been confirmed on, on an alligator farm where they were also fed nutria. Um, so there's definitely this difference. In our study, we also had much higher uh, lead burdens in the males, but that could be indicative of small sample size, or it might be that the females were indeed passing on lead in, to, to the embryos. Um, there's one recorded case of lead also in crocodile eggs, but the outcome is uncertain. So it would be really great in future to, to monitor this, uh, specifically in populations where people are recreational and fishing. Last slide, in terms of actions, one can ban uh, uh, um, lead bullets that has been done in the state. They use bismuth, which is also quite a soft, heavy, heavy metal. Um, Existing lead bullets may persist for many years. So even though you not, might, you know, use steel bullets, as I've mentioned with the magpie geese, they might still take up these uh, shot that is available in the environment for many years to come. You can replace lead sinkers with steel weights, which has been done in the States in some places. So this apparent resistance is quite is still unexplained, at least with crocodilians. Um, and it has, it's a good idea to do some further research, specifically in terms of transfer of, of lead burdens to embryos and fertility, um, et cetera, for different size classes, not just for, for adults. Uh, we did sample 25 more crocodiles at St. Lucia early this year, and the, the blood results will be forthcoming in January next year. Thank you also for going over my time.